Hey there, my friends, and a warm welcome into another episode of the Winsome Creationist Podcast. I hope you all have been doing well. I have been out of town on vacation and then under the weather. Uh, you can still maybe hear it in my voice uh, a little bit. I'm not quite as high as it normally is. Um, and uh, just a little bit under the weather. And so I'm grateful for you joining me. And um, again, sorry to be uh, to have missed an episode in late September, but I hope you all have been uh, doing well. Um, I'm excited about this episode. Uh, I'm going to be sharing a concept from my new book that I don't think I've ever talked about here on the podcast. Uh, I might have briefly hinted at it before, uh, but I'm not sure that I've ever uh, full on talked about it in the past. And um, I'm excited about it. I, I think it is going to be a a useful thing and a controversial thing. Uh, I suppose that um, I am no stranger uh, to controversy when it comes to creationism. I tend to gravitate uh, 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 toward it, unfortunately. Um, but that does seem to be how it works. So I, I think it's going to be a useful concept. And it's called Mere young age creationism. Yep, we're borrowing some terminology uh, from C.S. Lewis here, and uh, I like how others have used that. Tim Stratton, my friend, um, has used it uh, to talk about Molinism, this theological concept of Molinism, and he calls it mere Molinism. And his idea there is that uh, even if you are uh, a flavor of Calvinist, you can actually uh, still be a Molinist. And so that's why he calls it mere Molinism. Well, today... I want to talk about what mere young age creationism looks like. And I'm going to do that by giving you some thoughts uh, directly out of my upcoming book that I have, uh, The Winsome Creationist, that I'm diligently working on. And I hope and pray it'll be useful for you to consider. Uh, One little um, just bit of housekeeping if you're on uh, YouTube watching me right now. Um... This is going to sound really weird, but just go with me, okay? Um, I'm not looking at the camera, except right now. I just looked at the camera. Um, Just an experiment. It's not going to hurt trying an episode or two like this. Um, There's two reasons that I'm not looking at the camera. Number one is um, I just really like audio podcasts. The problem is is people don't find audio podcasts. Um, uh, People uh, uh, find videos, okay? Um, but I I don't like looking at the camera. That sounds weird. Um, but you know, it just is what it is. Um, I don't mind a camera being on while I'm talking, uh, but looking at the camera and filming videos is really just not my favorite thing to do. I want my podcast to feel, uh, more like an audio podcast than, uh, than me creating a video production. So if you hate that, if you hate this, if you're watching on YouTube, leave it in the comments. Um, the other alternative, if I don't want to look at a camera, frankly, is to just have the audio episode on YouTube, but sometimes that's annoying too. I do at least like to see somebody's facial expressions, and I actually prefer to watch, um, if I'm going to watch a video podcast, I actually prefer the type where they're not actually looking at the camera, as weird as that sounds. So if you hate this and, and you think it's terrible, uh, and, and you're not going to watch my videos anymore because of it, uh, then let me know below, and I, I will take your feedback seriously. Um Otherwise, uh, I'm just going to try this and uh, see how it goes. Um, The second reason why is because, again, here's another weird one, uh, but sometimes when you create short form video like reels, uh, which I may start doing, um, uh, believe it or not, sometimes they are more shareable, like more likely to be found by more people um, if they... uh, yeah, if they actually have somebody not looking directly at the camera, right? But it's clear that they're on a, a podcast or something more like that. Really weird, um, but you know, it just is what it is. And if I had a third reason, I guess it would be because rather than like looking down at my notes and looking back at the camera and that being kind of awkward and whatnot, is um, I could just kind of look at my notes here on the screen and uh, and talk about it. So I'm uh, sorry for that little bit of housekeeping, uh, but hopefully you see where I'm coming from on that and you just, you know, feel free to let me know if you have any thoughts. All right, so let's dive into this concept. So this uh, this concept of mere young age creationism comes out of a, a a chapter in my book, the first chapter of my book actually, on what is young age creationism. And so uh, I I believe it's important if you're going to uh, talk about a a view 
uh, that you should articulate it. And, and actually, let me just, uh, I'm going to backtrack and I'm going to give one more clarifying thing. Uh, if you... Um, if you listen to my last episode of the podcast, I talked about how uh, my book is like a- a roughly 80,000 words long. Um, well, here's the thing. I thought it was going to be uh, 70,000. That's the number I kept coming back to. As I started to get further along in the book, uh, the, the number came more to like 80,000. And what actually ended up happening when I got all through it is it it ended up if by by taking that series that I was going to to you know to to make and then actually take this one too um uh, uh the the what I had been working on writing and then uh, combine it with that series that I had made like I explained uh, in the previous episode it turned out to be over 92,000 words that's a long book <laughs> especially for a niche topic like uh, creationism. So I've thought about it. Uh, I've, I've prayed about it. I've talked to some people about it. And um, I, I'm not going to lie. I'm still trying to decide for sure how I'm going to do this. As of this moment, what I have decided is I'm actually going to cut the book in half. And I'm just going to make the this book be this book, right? The initial outline for this book that I started with and, and going through it. Specifically, uh, the audience for this book being those who are currently committed creationists. I mean, you guys, the kind of people who listen to this podcast, okay? So um, the first chapter, the, this will now be a seven-chapter book, doing it this way, 53,000 words, so way more um, uh, manageable. I may still write an additional conclusion or appendix, and that might bump it up closer to 60, which would be like a perfectly normal, standard uh, nonfiction book. I, I don't think this needs to be a 100,000-word tome. Uh, that nobody's going to read. So I hope that makes sense. I think it'll actually be a little bit more aligned. And then later on, I will probably write a, a, a book starting with the other manuscript material that I have uh, that is geared towards the more beginner creationist. I thought it would make more sense to keep this focused. Okay. So in this iteration of, um, uh, of things, the first chapter is what is, is, is young age creationism, a brief history. And uh, what we're going to do in this one is actually just go through like the uh, what creationists believe, okay, and um, also like what the last couple hundred years have looked like in terms of the creation science movement, and really talk specifically since the 1960s on the sort of modern creation science movement, okay. And uh, so what we're going to do here is look at well, what is this book? going to argue for okay as i wrote um it's my intention with this book to foster unity and not actually more division and so if we're going to do that then it's going to be really important to understand what we're actually uh unifying around okay so we're going to call this idea mere young age creationism and and as you listen to the these five ideas that i believe are are part of mere young age creationism you are probably going to notice <laughs> that there are some very important things missing and they're missing on purpose and we will uh sort of discuss some of those ideas and you can let me know what you think all right so here is the first one the first uh, pillar or idea of mere young age creationism. It's that Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, created everything and is transcendent. He is not a part of the creation and therefore is not contingent on the existence of anything else. He's the self-existent ground of all being and a personal loving creator. Okay, a pretty simple step one, right? I mean, if we're not all unified around that, then I don't know what else we can unify uh, around okay Yahweh created everything he's transcendent not a part of the creation he is the self-existent ground of all being that's step one here's step two according to Genesis 1 and confirmed by Exodus 20 11, creation took place within a span of six ordinary solar days God rested on the seventh day this model was given not out of necessity but as a pattern of work and rest for God's people. All right, so that is the second thing, is that according to Genesis 1, creation took place in six ordinary solar days. Now, the reason why it's important to lay out this whole thing, but like specifically number two here, is because 
in recent days, this language, which I discuss at length in the book, uh, th this language by some creationists has been used to throw rocks at other creationists, and uh, this language is by calling them an evolutionist. Okay, by calling them a young earth evolutionist. And I don't think that's fair because all young age creationists, including those ones who are called evolutionists, believe uh, that creation took place within a span of six ordinary solar days. Okay, so that's a very important pillar of this. Every young age creationist is going to believe that. All right, here's number three. Genealogies in Genesis 5 and 11 are unique in all of human history and are intended to communicate an unbroken chronological and historical linkage from Adam to Noah to Abraham. And they do not allow for approximately, uh, excuse me, for more than approximately 10,000 years of earth history. Okay, I have a footnote there talking about uh, open genealogies and closed genealogies and, uh, and sort of explaining uh, some of those things. Uh, but the idea here is that all creationists are going to recognize Genesis 5 and Genesis 11 as being unique. And um, not only that they're uh, unique in history, uh, but also that they are, in fact, intended to communicate a, a, a chronology. Now, this is something that is very interesting. Because I, I, I might know some creationists who would push back on this a little bit. Uh, but I think it's important because Genesis 5 and 11 have the exact kind of data that we need to have to create that unbroken linkage in terms of time from Adam to Noah to, to Abraham. They have the exact right information at the exact right time. Number one. Number two, it's the only information uh, like this in history at all, <laughs> right? Uh, it, it's, it's actually the only genealogy in all of ancient history we're aware of that, that actually gives this kind of information. Some have actually called these chrono genealogies because they're so intent on communicating time, and, and it seems to be in, in, intentional. So, I actually do think it's it's quite important, so important that it would be a pillar of mere young age creationism to say that these genealogies are in fact um, intended to communicate time um, and they're unique on their own right. They're where they are for a purpose and they do more uh, than just give us family information. They give us chronological information as well. And then all put together, they don't allow for approximately... Uh, for more than approximately 10,000 years worth of Earth history. And some of that math comes from Paul Garner's book, uh, The New Creationism. Okay, so if you're a mere young age creationist and you want to be below 10,000 years, then you're going to want these genealogies on your side. Okay, um, if you don't believe that these genealogies give you chronological information, um, then I think you're reasoning for being a, a, a young age creationist is, is, you know, not on a very sure foundation. Um, in other words, I, I think that you can overcome some of the objections from the other perspectives, but this one's a very hard one to overcome. All right, let's look at number four. The long lifespans of the biblical patriarchs are intended to be taken straightforwardly. While it is possible that some of these numbers are rounded for theological purposes, we may not therefore dismiss these numbers to extend the timeline. Okay, so this one ties right into number three, okay, is that the the long lifespans of the Bibli biblical patriarchs are, um, I, I use the word straightforwardly instead of literally, because people get really funny about the word literal, don't they? It's like, you know, if it was like 703 years, but it got rounded to 700 years, that's not literal, so blah, 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 right? Uh, all I'm trying to say is that these lifespans are intended to be taken straightforwardly. Sure, if there's like some sort of rounding thing going on, I'm fine with that, Um but like it, it, it's way more likely that you know if if somebody was seven hundred and three years old, the number got rounded to seven hundred, and I'm okay with that. I'm not okay with the guy living till he was like forty three, and then you know the number was rounded to seven hundred. You know that's ridiculous. I think. Um, so I, I think that the number should be taken straightforwardly, and I'm not aware of of any 
I have any real meaningful challenge to this. Now, if you have something you want to link me to in the comments below, please um, go ahead and do that. Uh, but so far, uh, I have not read anything that, that, that really provides a meaningful challenge to the idea that these ages are, are to be taken straightforwardly. And in fact, I have at least one, but probably more episodes out there in the future of, uh, uh, of things that I think actually argue for taking the ages straightforwardly. So... Um, I think that's going to be an important piece of it. And again, if you don't take those ages straightforwardly, then I think you lose uh, a lot of the, um, uh, you know, a, a lot of the gumption uh, for this view, right? I think you uh, you lose some of the foundation. All right, number five uh, of mere young age creationism is that there was a global flood that destroyed all life under the heavens, save those explicitly mentioned by the account. This flood was a tremendous upheaval that violently rearranged the earth, eliminating the possibility of deep geological time. All right, now that last phrase is uh, very important. Um, if you ha if you have a global flood, then uh, you don't have deep geological time. Uh, if you uh, do have like a local flood, uh, then you potentially could have deep geological time. It's just a matter of looking at the evidence, okay? This is why many people are going to take the view uh, that if the earth is old, then the flood was local um, because you just can't have both uh, geologically speaking. Um, at least as a non-geologist, that's what I understand the case to be. So a young age creationist is going to be uh, explicitly tied to the global flood uh, view and I, I would say specifically they're going to need to be tied to a um, a very violent um, interpretation uh, of the flood. You know, not something like this tranquil flood view that's uh, sort of fallen out of popularity uh, in recent years. Okay, so mere young age creationism. Yahweh created everything. Genesis one says six ordinary solar days is uh, the timeline on the uh, that the earth was created in. Uh, uh, the genealogies in Genesis 5 and 11 are unique in all of human history. Um, the long lifespans of the biblical patriarchs are intended to be taken straightforwardly. And there was a global flood that destroyed all life under the heavens. Now, that seems a very, um, in one sense, modest view of creationism. Um, in another sense, it's comprehensive. It's comprehensive in the sense that I really do believe that uh, if you're going to be a young age creationist, really those are the things that you should believe, right? Now, there's some things that I did not mention, and I'll go way more at length when you read the book um, on this on this uh, concept and, and all of these concepts, but I'll just briefly mention a few here, okay? Um, some things that I didn't mention that you're probably thinking, well, wait a minute, um, where was that? That's missing, right? And uh, one caveat I'll give is that um, I, while I don't uh, elaborate, even in the book, I don't elaborate on my specific view of most of these things, even though you can probably pick it up. Um, everything I'm going to mention here, I hold to like the traditional sort of creationist uh, understanding of. Okay, so I'm going to go through these things real quick. And then I'm going to tell you why I didn't include them sort of as a general, um, as a general uh, point of view. All right, uh, death before sin. What about that? Isn't that like, I mean, if you if you go visit like the Creation Museum, the Ark Encounter, these attractions in Kentucky, uh, they're going to make quite a big deal of of the idea of, of death uh, entering into the world. And, you know, for good reason. I mean, I think God makes a big deal out of that. Um, uh, for sure, it's a huge part of, of Paul's um, theology, okay? So my caveat to this would be is that uh, I do believe that um, that a a consistent young age creationist is, is very likely going to have to take the view that human death was actual, right? So the difference is like was death possible versus was death actual? Okay, I, that's a really important distinction I think that we should make. Um, I I don't think the Bible teaches or allows for the view that human death was actual before sin possible that's a really tough one i don't think so i personally don't think so um now animal death though i don't think animal death was was actual before sin um but i do know some young age creationists who are unsure of that 
and unconvinced that animal death and, and, and carnivory were entirely absent pre-fall. And they would, um, you know, I don't want to argue for them here, but, but, but they would, you know, they would argue, I think on the basis and, and sort of take the position that, um, um, maybe those verses in like Genesis 1, 29 and 30, like they're being stretched a little bit too far, uh, to say that even though, uh, humans and animals were vegetarians, it doesn't mean that there was no pre-fall animal, uh, carnivory and, uh, and, and death. So, Again, um, th the point of this podcast is not to argue that th this point. It's just to say that um, given the reality of the situation, I don't think death before sin is something that you have to believe to be a young age creationist. It's part of it, okay? But it's it's not the whole picture. Uh, you know, pretty much tying right into it is vegetarianism, okay? Uh, again, some people, Genesis 1, 29 and 30, uh, just don't believe that um, that humans and animals were actually vegetarians uh, before the fall. Now, again, seems like a natural reading of the text, and it fits perfectly inside this uh, paradigm, uh, but it's not necessary to believe in young age creationism, okay? It, it's one of these other things um, that has just been kind of glommed on to young age creationists and to say, well, if you don't believe this, you're like a bad guy <laughs> or, or, or your, you know, your theology is trash or, or whatever. Um, and that may be true, but it, it's, it's not really related to whether or not they're young age creationists. This, here's one that's, you know, really fascinating is dinosaurs in the Bible. Do you know, I know a lot of creationist dinosaur experts who are not sure that there's anything like a dinosaur in the Bible. Now, my goodness, that's blasphemy, you know, if you read creationist material uh, for the past few decades. But leading dinosaur experts in young age creationism are currently not convinced that dinosaurs are actually in the Bible. The only place where I think a mere young age creationist has to see dinosaurs in the Bible is on day six of creation. But that doesn't mean they need to be stated there. It just means we need to understand that dinosaurs as land animals were created on day six of creation. There's lots of land animals that are unnamed, and so there's no reason to expect an explicit mention of them there. Um, but that's really the only thing. Right now, if you if you happen to see dinosaurs in Job, perfect, right? Uh, but, you know, I think that's the only place you got to have them, uh, other than, of course, some version of them on Noah's Ark, which could have been babies or youths or whatever. And, of course, the, the normal size of a dinosaur is like, like a buffalo, right? The average dinosaur size was like a buffalo, right? Not not these huge things that we're used to thinking of when we think of a of a dinosaur. Uh, here's another one: uh, is uh, scientific foreknowledge. Okay, um, basically the view that the Bible uh, gives advanced knowledge of modern science. Um, people argue this a lot. It has been in the past from the Book of Job, right? Um, this idea that you know that we know that the Earth is round and floating in space, right? Um, now I admit there's passages of the Bible that I look at and I'm like, wow, if it's not talking about, you know, modern science, um, I don't know what it is talking about. And yet at the end of the day, I realized that, that, that these, that the biblical writers didn't know anything about modern science. So what does that look like? Right. What's that interplay between scientific foreknowledge and, um, and taking the text a as an ancient document. And we do talk about that a little bit in the book. Original sin. Here's an interesting one, right? Um, please don't send me hate mail. Don't throw rocks at me, okay? But it, this really depends on what you mean by original sin, okay? Um, I believe Romans 5.12 teaches that uh, death was passed on to all men, not guilt, okay? And... Um, you know, argue that with me if you want to. Fine, it's been argued for hundreds of years. I don't think we're going to, you know, make any specific headway on that. Um, but I think it can be argued very well from the text uh, that the doctrine of original sin proper, which is that Adam is our federal head and that we are, um, uh, that we take part in in, in Adam's guilt uh, for sin. Um, I, I don't think that can uh, be argued from the text as strongly as... Um, some would think. So I put it like this. I said we might say that the doctrine of original sin depends upon young age creationism, but young age creationism does not depend upon the doctrine of original sin. That's why it's not a part of mere young age creationism. So you don't have to believe the Reformation doctrine uh, of original sin, capital O, capital S, to be a young age creationist. But if you do believe in original sin, 
I think it's um, way easier to make sense of these passages that that uh, that some argue teach it right. So I think uh, if you're going to believe in original sin, it, it's helpful to be a young age creationist. The structure of the days, right? Um, a tactic used by some scholars has been to uh, just uh, look at the days as uh, you know different structural elements, like the framework hypothesis. Um, well, the thing is, is a, a mere young age creationist can see some of these structures, but we just have to minimally understand them as six ordinary days. Um, I think these other literary frameworks can be applied uh, as well and held in addition to the traditional uh, view. Um, and a great, there's a great paper written on this, um, Dr. Robert something. <laughs> I, I think he used to work with, uh, with Dallas uh, Theological Seminary. Um, his name will hit me uh, here soon. I'm, I'm sure it will. But he wrote a, a great series of articles in the Answers Research Journal, or he wrote them for a different journal, and they were republished in the Answers Research Journal, talking about the framework hypothesis. And I think he makes just a great point there that, you know, yeah, we can we can look at the framework uh, hypothesis, look at the framework of the days, um, and, and and see some some awesome theological design in these passages. But when you press them. To be literal, you run into lots of problems. McCabe, that's his last name. Uh, Dr. Robert McCabe, um, wonderful guy, seems to uh, seems to do really, really good work, and uh, I've appreciated his writing. And, uh, and he shares that in there. He talks about how if you take the framework and press it to the literal conclusion that they want to— um, then you're gonna, you, you know, you're gonna turn into some pretty big problems. Run into some pretty big problems. What about uh, interactions with the serpent? Right. I mean, creationists often take the passage of Genesis three as like questioning God's word. Right. Well, you know, God's word versus man's word. The first time that was questioned was in the beginning. Okay, fine. Uh, I agree with that. Like, you know, but it doesn't really relate to the age of the earth debate. Um, that was definitely not the context of the garden conversation. And so we're just not going to hitch young age creationism to that passage. It's kind of like when Jesus said um, to Nicodemus, it's like, if I tell you earthly things and you don't understand, like how am I supposed to tell you spiritual things and you don't understand? Creationists use that all the time. Um, and it's like the context of that passage just has nothing to do with, um, with like the, you know, with science, like the physical representation of the earth. And if you, um, if you want to argue with me on that, well, please go ahead. Uh, but uh, Dr. Bill Barrick uh, opened up the um, uh, the last international conference on creationism, actually talking about this and 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 making a pretty big deal out of how creationists have misused that passage as an example of how, as creationists, we want to make sure that we're being biblically and theologically accurate in everything that we do. So we got to be careful not to take things out of context or, or use them unnecessarily. And the last one I wrote down is creation and perfection, right? So it's very common to hear that uh, young age creationists um, uh, uh, hear, hear them say that God made a perfect world. Now, the text does not use the word perfect, okay? Even though something like perfection is strongly implied. It, it annoys me when I see this and I see it all over. The word perfect is used actually a lot. Um, inside of uh, inside of the uh, answers in Genesis attractions uh, too, and I just disagree with the terminology because it's not quite precise. Specifically, the Hebrew word means is very good. Tov meod. It's it's very good. In a very good world, it seems to me, is the world that would be consistent with uh, how God wanted the world to function. Okay, um, the world did. It was very good to God. It did what He wanted it to do. Okay. The reason why I don't use the word perfect is because you run into problems, which is actually, you know, this concept was was, um, was brought up by Dr. Danny Faulkner, who works for Answers in Genesis. And um, he talks about this, the, the cratering hypothesis on the, on the fourth day of creation, um, during the creation of the uh, sun, moon, stars, you know, whatever you believe on that. Um, was there cratering going on? And if there was cratering going on, if there was like erosion in riverbeds, you know, um, if, if, what, what if, what if actually, uh, uh, rocks had hit the earth literally during the fourth day of creation. There was, there was some cratering events that happened on the earth. Like, does that mean that the earth wasn't perfect? No, I don't think so at all. But if you're, if you're talking about a perfect world, it would be hard to imagine rocks being thrown at the earth during the process of the creation of our solar system, say, um, <laughs> and, and still calling that a perfect world. Okay, so that's where, where the word like perfect 
um, is a little bit difficult for me. All right, so what's the overall point here as we begin to sort of draw this one to a close? Well, uh, the overall point, I think, is that one of the, the big issues that I'm going to sort of argue on here in the book um, is that the one of the big problems with creationism today is that too many things have been added on to what it means to actually be a young age creationist. And that has been the cause of lots of division in the church and, and within young age creationism even as a whole. And look, it's a small group of people anyway. We need each other, frankly, you know. Uh, we don't need to be fighting. Okay, and so uh, I think it's very important that we settle on what it is to actually just be a young age creationist and then agree and, and we can disagree where we disagree. And we have a whole chapter, long chapter on what it looks like uh, biblically to disagree amongst ourselves and with other flavors of creationists as well. We talk about a biblical philosophy of disagreement. We look at Paul and how he talked about disagreement uh, that comes later in the book also in chapter four. So, uh, but to do that, we have to know what we agree on. And so I'm trying to, to frame this view, excuse me, I'm trying to frame this view. Um, so I'm trying to frame this view of, of, of mere young age creationism as a way to say, hey, look, let's, let's sort of join hands on these things because they're the most important things. And then let's explore and we're, we're free to explore and discover and look at science, and look at God's word, and, and, and God's world, and make sense of everything, as long as we don't compromise on these ideas, right? And even that word compromise, I go into length on it in the book, it drives me nuts. <laughs> it's because, um, be, because the meaning uh, of the word compromise is not like inherently bad, even though it, it, it's been sort of made out to be, especially in creationist circles, okay? So, um, I'm going to cut it off here. Uh, you can read more about my thoughts on compromise and such um, actually in the book. And I hope this concept of mere young age creationism has been something uh, for you that is very helpful. Um, given my travels and everything, I still have not been able to get a um, a, a free chapter of the book uh, up on my website for you to download. I'm still working on that. Uh, I will try to have it done by the next time. <laughs> that uh, that we get on here and hopefully you'll be ready to, to go grab that free chapter. Um, let me know what you think in the comments here. Mere young age creationism. Um, you know, do I need to include some of these other items and why? Give me an argument. Let me know why you think so. Um, if that's the case, if you're watching on YouTube, leave a comment there. Um, if you're uh, listening on a podcast, you can go to YouTube and leave the comment or you can send me an email, steve at stevesram.com and I, I will get that as well. And uh, for now, Lord bless. I hope you guys have a, a great couple weeks and we'll talk real, real soon. Bye-bye.